All right. Well, welcome everybody to this special uh, webinar from the Environmental Resilience Institute. Today's topic is going to focus on Future Water, which is a new re resource or a website that was released just a few months ago. My name is Andrea Webster. I'm the Implementation Manager at the Environmental Resilience Institute and coordinator of this webinar series. So before we get started, I want to let you know that everyone's muted. You're able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question, but we ask that you not you save that, uh, that option until the end. But if you have a question in the middle of the webinar um, that's urgent or clarifying, please type it into the chat box, which you can access by hovering your mouse over the webinar screen and you'll see a chat function pop up. So we are recording today's webinar, uh, and so we will send you uh, an email probably uh, later in the week with a, a link to where you can access that webinar and share it with all of your colleagues and friends. Uh, and with that, I'm very pleased to introduce the director of the Environmental Resilience Institute, Janet McCabe, who is going to be today's webinar, webinar moderator. All right, uh, thanks Andrea and welcome everyone. I think we have a record number of attendees this time, which is just fantastic. Um, we're really excited about today's presentation. We will hear from the, uh, the key people who actually created this um, uh, amazing tool called Future Water. Chen Zhu, with support from Marlon Pierce, has created a detailed model of Indiana's largest watershed, the Wabash River Basin, and they've placed that model in a publicly accessible format for everyone to use. The model simulates precipitation, soil, water content, stream flow, and a number of other parameters through the year 2100 under different climate, um, uh, future climate scenarios. Um, and what, what I'm excited about today, and this is a little bit of a different sort of webinar than our usual webinars, um, is that uh, this tool has been created, a lot of work has gone into creating this tool, and I'm just really excited about the different ways I am sure people are gonna to find to use this tool. And uh, the, the, the first time that uh, Chen and Marlon showed me this, I said, well, we've gotta get people in Indiana who uh, focus on water issues, people from the ag community, um, people from the um, uh, local government, everybody to, to see this tool um, so that we can let a thousand flowers bloom about the way it could be useful to people. So great to have you all here today. Um, uh, one of the things that we're going to do as part of that effort um, to make this tool most, most useful to people is send you a, um, a survey right after the webinar um, before you've um, forgotten everything and moved on to the next um, to ask you for information for your ideas about how you think you might use the tool. And um, so, so please uh, watch out for that and please do send it in to us. Um, okay, so uh, just quickly for those of you that might be new to our webinar series or to the Environmental Resilience Institute, um, uh, we are an institute created a couple of years ago by IU as part of the Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge. Um, we focus on um, uh, bringing the power of IU's academic resources um, to help Indiana become more resilient in the face of climate change. We recognize that this is an interdisciplinary uh, team effort and that the university has to partner with lots of people outside the university in order for us all to be effective. In particular, Andrea Webster and I have worked on developing a number of uh, tools and resources specifically targeted towards local governments, although um, of course open to everybody. Um, those include this webinar series, uh, the Hoosier Resilience Index and uh, the Environmental Resilience Institute Toolkit, two resources that I would um, urge you to check out if you're not familiar with them. Um, we also um, uh, at IU and through the initiative are supporting a lot of uh, environmental and climate uh, journalism and uh, communication through our In This Climate podcast, which is really fun actually, um, and our Indiana Environmental Reporter. Um, this webinar is actually not part of our regular webinar series. Our regular webinars are the second Wednesday of every month from 12 to 1, um, and they are typically on resilience, climate change, and environmental change related topics that have been suggested to us by local governments. Um, so please uh, check out our upcoming webinars 
Um, we actually um, have a couple of, uh, we, we pivoted pretty quickly um, to uh, change the topics of the upcoming webinars to things that, that perhaps are a little bit more relevant uh, to the COVID-19 crisis that we're going through. Um, and I think Andrea might have a slide that shows what, what those are. Um, the next one will be about communication for local governments. Um, and then uh, our one in May, um, really getting some experts on to talk about the connections between diseases like the virus and environmental change or climate change. Um, economic value of preparedness and resilience, one of the things that we've heard from local governments a lot is that they really need help in understanding the costs and benefits of different resilience activities. Um, and then um, right when we might be having some extreme heat, we will have a webinar on extreme heat. Um, we are recording, as Andrea said, um, so all of our webinars are archived. So um, if you think that there's somebody that would have enjoyed listening to this today, um, you can certainly uh, give them the, the link um, or watch it yourself. You know, we all, we all are finding more ways to look at our screens these days. Um, we have a lot of people um, registered for today, um, including a lot of new organizations. We're really thrilled to see that. Um, so thanks for spreading the word. Okay, I'm going to introduce both of our speakers and then I'll just turn it over to them and they will handle the presentation uh, between the two of them. Um, as Andrea said, if you have chat questions, um, stick them in the box and we'll get to them um, and we'll have time for questions at, at the end. Um, so uh, Dr. Chen Zhu is a professor in IU's Earth and Atmosphere Atmospheric Sciences Department. He studies the chemistry of water and its reactions with minerals and rocks. His research has addressed water quality, such as what chemicals are in water, how did they get there, and where are they going to end up. His research has also addressed water quantity, such as how much water recharges an aquifer and whether the amount of withdrawal is environmentally sustainable. He studies contamination of surface and groundwater, large scale numerical models of water flow and contaminant transport. He led the Future Water Project um, and we're just thrilled to have him here today. Uh, Marlon Pierce is director of IU's Cyber Infrastructure Integration Research Center. Um, and I'll just tell you that most of the stuff that Marlon says, I do not understand, but it's real, I know it's really important. His work supports computational and data-driven science. He investigates the development of science gateway technologies that provide science-centric user services and interfaces for advanced computing infrastructure. The focus of his work is to adapt web and cloud scale distributed systems approaches to the needs of communities of scientific researchers. Marlin's team led the implementation of the Future Water site, which you will see in, in detail today, and you'll see what an amazing creation it is. Um, Marlin received his PhD from Florida State University in 1998 in computational condensed matter physics. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. And Chen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Janet. Can, can you hear me, Andrew? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Andrew, Andrew, can you see my screen and can you hear me? So we can see your presentation view. Okay, and yes. And we can hear you. Oh, you cannot hear me because you mu muted me. Oh, uh, no, we can hear you. Oh, you um, can hear me. Okay, great. I, I can't see the actual, uh, I'm seeing, you know, the double slides with your notes. Oh, you uh, see my notes? Yeah, instead of the actual presentation. Oh, um, huh. If you have a, if you have two screens, it's possible you share the wrong screen. Okay, so I'm You might have to, to stop and, and reshare. Okay, yeah. I'm share screen again. Uh, let me see this. All right. Yeah, I think you're correct. And, uh, let me see. Screen share has failed to start. Okay. Right. Well, I can try sharing your slides for you, uh, but keep uh, trying. No, let me let me try again. Um, it should just be a second, it should be fine. Sure. Okay. So, 
Can you see me, me now? Yes. Okay, so you can hear me, you can see me, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation. Yep, it looks right. great. Okay, well, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chen Zhu, and Janet, thank you for the introduction. Um, my uh, crime in, <laughs> partner in crime is uh, Dr. Marlon Pierce, and uh, he is here uh, too. Uh, and okay. Um, so um, I have lived in the state of Indiana for 16 years now. I think I've become a Hoosier. I'll be very <laughs> uh, down to earth. And just to tell you directly, uh, what is the future water dot Indiana dot uh, edu? Okay, what is the future water? Um, so I want to uh, directly go to into this. Um, first of all, we developed a hydrological model uh, that is um, um, <clears throat> uh, for the Wabash Basin uh, to the year 2100, end of this century. Uh, so here is the Wabash River Basin. And uh, so this is kind of a natural boundary. Uh, the state lines are the administrative boundary. Uh, the, the Wabash River originated in the northern Indiana and uh, uh, here, Ohio, and flow most of the state. Uh, it, and you see that the river basin covers a little bit of the Illinois uh, and a tiny bit of Ohio. Um, Andrew, do you see my uh, cursor uh, when I move the mouse? Okay, great. And as you know, uh, the Wabash flows into the Ohio River here, and Ohio flows into Mississippi, and the Mississippi discharge into Gulf of Mexico, and you know all that, but I just want to remind you that uh, um, we are a bigger contributor of the nutrients that discharge in Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> so this is what is covered. We have, we, uh, the, the model covered the Wabash River Basin, uh, that is the most of the uh, Indiana. Um, and this is a hydrological model, right? It's the, uh, a physical model. So they have a lot of physical data in that, uh, that including topography, land cover, land use, the soil type distribution in this Wabash, the hydrography, uh, that means the, the network of the streams. And also, we also have the uh, stream flow data. And all those data sets are uh, available from federal agencies and some from the uh, state agency. So those are all data downloaded from federal agencies. And those are the model input. Um, and uh, you can see this is also a forecast model, right? To the end of the century, year uh, 2100. Uh, so we needed to have a climate forecast. And that we obtained from the University of Notre Dame. And this is the paper they published in 2018. And this climate model is the same climate data that Purdue University and the other university teams put into this uh, Indiana climate assessment report. Um, but, but here the climate model is not only uh, one model. We actually, they have 10 different models. Uh, Notre Dame developed more than uh, 10 models. So uh, in, in the technical world, it's called ensemble of climate model. And you can see they have uh, uh, three different climate scenarios, uh, ICP 2.6, uh, ICP 4.5, and ICP 8.5. These are different climate scenarios, right? We're predicting future, so have different kinds of scenarios. And this is a 10 different models uh, prediction from the University of Notre Dame. Um, the RCP here uh, stands for representative concentration pathways. So uh, the median projection is a 4.5 and the, uh, the high emission scenario uh, is 8.5. Um, <clears throat> again, this is from this uh, uh, Notre Dame data and put it into the Indiana Climate Change Impact Assessment Report by Purdue. And, and here they use the, uh, some metaphors, uh, metaphor to show how the climate is going to change. Um, so if this is the summer of uh, Indiana uh, present or in the recent past, 
uh, by middle of the century in the high CO2 emission scenario uh, in the summer will feel more like Arkansas. Um, by the end of the century will feel more like um, uh, Eastern Texas. So they are predicting about 10 degree Fahrenheit hotter uh, in the summer uh, in this uh, high emission scenario. Um, so our concern here is water. Uh, will Indiana have enough water uh, in the middle century, the end of the century? And, uh, um, but we know that the water cycle, like you'll see here, the Khartoum water cycle is very sensitive to, temp to temperature changes and the precipitation changes. <clears throat> and that's the, uh, the, the, the motivation right, uh, for uh, our study. We want to know whether there are going to be enough water in the future. Uh, we are endowed uh, with a, a lot of water. Uh, we are very lucky about that uh, uh, compared to other places in the world. Um, so we use the software called a SWOT, uh, Soil Water Assessment Tool. Uh, this is a software developed and distributed by Department of uh, Agriculture. So uh, we choose to use that software uh, because this is a well-documented uh, and uh, software package and it has gone through quality control and quality assurance. As a, that's mostly uh, the, the federal government uh, developed the software and uh, the work right, is required. And it uh, has a very large user base, uh, like 20,000 people in the world. So the non-computer bugs are already worked out. Um, so the, so uh, we, we did not want to use, uh, say, a software package from a brilliant uh, graduate student at IU, but uh, nobody knows what's in the software. Uh, there's no documentation about that. Uh, that's not good. So we choose to use a software package uh, that is developed and distributed by uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, <coughs> and uh, uh, it has uh, it's it's very well documented. And then we run this software uh, on IU's supercomputers. Um, as many of you know, that IU has uh, wonderful. Uh, powerful supercomputers. We have the Big Red 2, we now have uh, Big Red 3 and Big Red 200. And you need this kind of power uh, to do thousands of simulations to calibrate the model. Um, and so we run this model on, um, uh, on the RU supercomputers. Uh, you also need a lot of storage spaces because um, <coughs> the hydrological cycle is modeled uh, on daily basis. So you have 100 years and then, uh, or 30 years and by every day. Uh, also, you see we have 10 different climate models. So under two different um, scenarios of a climate. So actually we have 61 uh, models altogether. So uh, we have a lot of input data, very large amount of input data, but we have also have a humongous amount of output data right, uh, from these models. So, so you need a kind of a, um, the IU's uh, uh, cyber infrastructure uh, to do that. And, uh, and this is a, uh, where Marlin's group uh, contributed greatly uh, that we developed a workflow uh, that, uh, uh, that we can uh, reproduce the model or update the model uh, very uh, quickly. But um, more important is that uh, unlike most of this kind of research you have you have seen uh, at the universities, uh, we went uh, one step further and devoted a lot of uh, efforts to visualize uh, the, the modeling output. And that also the output are uh, available for download. So now I want to uh, directly uh, go to this site, um, futurewater.indiana.edu, and show you um, the modeling results, um, which are visualized as a map. So I probably have to uh, switch to a screen in order to show you that. So let me stop and put a, a screen this. <clears throat> okay, so I need to share a different screen here now. All right, so Andrew, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, everybody can? Yes. All right. So this is the site, uh, Future Water 
.indiana.edu. And when you get on the site, there's a one button here to say, learn about the project. So you want to know the scope of the project, you want to the team and the publications, you can put that. But if you put, uh, click this button uh, on the right, say explore modeling forecast, and that will lead you to the modeling uh, output. Okay, so uh, you can see the map, Andrew. Yep. All right, everybody yep, can see so the map. Good. Okay, yep. so this is the Wabash River Basin and the little polygons and the suburb basin. And you can, so you can see we put the modeling output uh, on the web. Uh, is a free access to everyone. Uh, everyone has internet, you can access that. So now I want to draw your attention to uh, the uh, tab called the variables. So you can see we can uh, plot uh, precipitation, um, evapotranspiration, soil water content, groundwater recharge, base flow, stream flow, and yield, right? And so now it shows precipitation. Uh, the, 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 the burgundy uh, colored uh, means the differences, um, uh, the, the reduced percentage compared to historical mean. And the historical mean as shown here is the average of 1971 to year 2000. So those are the first, the, those are the color coded um, the blue shows you increase, and the, uh, this color shows you decrease. And this other predicted future minus the average, historic average, and divide by historic average. So you can see uh, this is the Notre Dame's prediction of um, precipitation, <coughs> and it's slightly increased. So now, and this is on this tab is annual, right? Or you can choose different months. And on this tab is different time periods. So now I'm in 2020, 2050. You can also choose say end of the century. And you see the map refresh itself. So by end of the century, we see this part of the uh, state, we see higher precipitation, right? Um, and here you show different emission scenarios, right? This is the median scenario, high scenario. And on this, uh, menu, you see uh, the smaller, right, um, hot units or the medium or the large, right? So, um, and so you have all, all these choices. Now, okay, so now I'm in the annual uh, end of the century, 2020, 80s, and the median scenario in the small. Uh, basin units, and this, this is the precipitation. This is from Notre Dame, and the, see here's our results in terms of stream flow. Right, so this is the stream flow, and you can see here uh, we have a little bit increase, but this part, right, we have a large decrease, and those are the percentage of changes against the historical mean, and those data. Uh, you can view the data available, right? And, and so this is stream flow. We can see what yield, and you can see that. Uh, you you can also get into a specific uh, uh, summer basin, like say Bloomington. I'm living in Bloomington. I want to see a basin that is close to Bloomington, so I just click it, right? And the data show up. So those are the what yield. In this particular basin, this is a highlighted basin see here, and uh, uh, those are the values uh, in terms of different emission scenario, uh, different time period. Um, you see the dots here are the ensemble of climate models, right? The Notre Dame model, they, they did not give us one model, they gave us a 10, and that we take the temperature, precipitation, wind speed from their model, and this is the range of the models uh, to do that. And this box is the average of these 10 models. And this is what plotted in the, in the map. Um, so, um, so we done this forecast model. Uh, we developed some maps and the graphs. 
and um, uh, then make it available for you to access. And uh, also here, you see the tab here, so the interactive map, interactive plots, but also data downloads. So all those modeling data are also available um, for you to download. And those are the summer basins. So um, <clears throat> now I'm going back to the PowerPoint slides. I need to switch the screen. All right, so I think I need to get rid of this. All right. Um, do it again. All right. Okay, Andrea, uh, you see the PowerPoint slides? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Um, so now you see uh, that we developed a model on our use of supercomputers, and we, there's tremendous amount of data that spit out of this model. You have daily uh, those uh, values for different models. Uh, it's all stored on our use supercomputer. Uh, we developed the tools that visualize modeling results and um, uh, also the data available for download. Um, and this is all uh, um, have a, with, through the collaboration with the uh, uh, Marlins group, uh, we are able to use the fantastic um, in sub infrastructure at IU, I use the supercomputer. And we also automated this workflow. Uh, so that's what uh, um, uh, the where the modeling results are, if you're looking for. And I strongly urge you to visit this site. Um, it's the futurewater.indiana.edu. Uh, everybody can have access. Um, now, the model, um, the hydrological model that right behind this website uh, is published in a peer reviewed paper. Uh, by Jennifer uh, Dual-Runner and myself. Um, Jennifer was uh, a postdoc working at IU, worked with me, and now she's an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. And you can download the paper from uh, my research website. Uh, it's uh, hydrogeochem.earth.indiana.edu. Uh, we will probably make available uh, this uh, PowerPoint slides as a PDF file to, uh, for you as well. And this is published in uh, the peer referee <coughs> general water. And this is a very uh, respected journal. And also I sent this article to um, well-known hydrogeologists that I'm familiar with. And uh, they uh, tell me that the Jennifer did a, a great job um, developing this model. <clears throat> uh, we have another publication. Uh, this just come out uh, like a week ago. This is by a PhD student and uh, uh, he just, uh, this is published in uh, the Bulletin of uh, International Association of Hydrologic Science. This is also a peer reviewed paper and you can download from uh, the uh, research website that I'll point out to you. So those are the, you, if you want to know the technical details uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, and uh, how Jennifer and uh, Jin Rui did it, and you can read those papers. And uh, if uh, we uh, time permit, I will also go to into this uh, technical details. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so you know that what are we uh, kind of models we developed and where you can find the results and where the papers are. What are the uh, takeaway points? What are the major uh, conclusions from uh, these models? And those are su summarized by Jennifer. <clears throat> uh, basically, her model shows that. Uh, we will see more frequent soil moisture and hydrological droughts. So that means less water available uh, in streams. Um, and that's particularly in the summer months. <laughs> um, not only more frequent, but also more severe droughts. So this conclusion, it's in a sense is like this. Let's say we will have about the same or slightly higher precipitation in Indiana uh, in the future, uh, both for the median and high emission scenario. However, um, we still have less water available 
in soils for crop growth and in streams for our use. Why? Uh, two reasons. One, the temperature is going to be higher, so therefore we have more evaporation, right? We have high, a slightly high precipitation, but the evaporation is going to be higher. And, uh, and, for, and for the hydrogeologists, hydrologists in the audience, you know that evaporation is a huge term, right? It's a huge term in the water budget. A slight increase of evaporation, uh, you have a large uh, increase in, term, in terms of the amount. Um, and also we will have some kind of a seasonal shift. Uh, the, because the temperature warmer, so we see the, uh, the, the, uh, the season going to shift into the winter. Um, and uh, because of the seasonal shift, we will have more water to evaporate uh, in winter and in, in the early spring, like say. Uh, so all that result in the, uh, the, the consequence that we have, we will have we significantly uh, lower amount of soil moisture and stream flow. And also we increase the drought. So this is the basic, uh, the, the results uh, from uh, Jennifer's um, um, modeling study. Now this is, this results are not surprising and it's consistent with the other studies uh, in regional studies like this. Same kind of message, uh, you have increased temperature, you offset the uh, water cycle, and seasonal shift uh, can have a large effect on the hydrologic cycle as well. Uh, we, we probably do not uh, need to do this kind of a supercomputer model to understand this hydrologic cycle changes, uh, but now you see we put into uh, the consequence of the effect quantitatively in space and in time. In space, you see the summer basins, right? Which basin, some, not all in the Wabash Basin is the same. Some areas you see more effect. Some area you actually see increase of soil moisture and, uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, kind of mute my phone, um, and uh, 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 stream flow, um, so the spatially different and also different time and the different scenarios. And that's, so the conclusion, it is general conclusion itself, it's nothing shocking, nothing out of the ordinary, uh, but the modeling exercise put it in quantitatively and quantitatively in space and in time. All right, so this is a main uh, uh, conclusion uh, of this. And uh, if I have time, uh, I will uh, tell you more about uh, the, the, the technical details. <clears throat> okay. Um, so you can see here that we don't want to just publish a paper and, uh, uh, and that, that the paper collect dust, right? Uh, there are so many papers published every year as a, according to National Science Foundation. It's like 2.3 million papers are published about science engineering every year. And here certainly we want uh, to leverage our use cyber infrastructure and use this kind of hydrological models. Uh, we will make it available to the public, uh, like uh, say the, the future water.indiana.edu is um, um, available to everyone. Uh, we want to make results you can download and available to uh, the state agencies and uh, other group, not NGO groups, and also available for uh, what the modeling calls the power users. If you are hydrogeologist in the audience, uh, work for state agencies, you want to run your own model, um, you can contact me and Marlon and we can set up an account for you at IU and you can run your own model and, uh, um, <clears throat> to do that. Um, it's also a live model, it's not just done once. It can be updated very easily. And I say that we collaborated with the uh, Marlins group, we have workflow. Uh, we have a preprocessor, post-processor, uh, that can be, uh, the model can be reproduced very um, 
uh, easily. So uh, uh, obviously, the biggest uncertainty that you already can see is the climate model, right? Uh, we have 10 different models, uh, ensemble model, climate models, and that, that predict the different temperature precipitation. Uh, and there are some new models going to come out this year. And uh, when, when it come out, we can update the hydrological project, uh, projections, right? Uh, and as, uh, then we have a newer versions um, that include uh, groundwater and nutrients in the future. There are some doctor students working on that. Um, well, so we have presented all these results, nice maps, the graphs. Um, can you believe the model or any model? Do you believe any model in the world? Well, according to Einstein, that uh, um, a series or model is nobody believes except the person who made it. An experiment is something everybody believes except the person who made it. And that's very true. I do both experiments and uh, models. And uh, um, uh, if you only believe experiments, uh, well, you should do some experiments yourself. <laughs> um, and, but it's a, a very, another very famous quote about model is by this British statistician, and all models are wrong, some are useful. And uh, I think this very important uh, point is that this is a software package um, is develop, developed and distributed by uh, USDA, and they have gone through quality assurance, quality control process. And it's not like, say, I had a brilliant graduate student who developed a code and nobody has checked on him or her. This is a product that has been used in regulatory environments and can be used in uh, regulatory environments. Um, we are a university, we're not a consulting firm, but we, uh, part of our education, uh, mission is education, right? So we have to uh, develop from simple models to more complicated models. And now, first of all, you know, we have the collaboration with the historical observation, and you can see that the PhD student just published a paper. Uh, we had a postdoc, Jennifer, uh, predicted to the end of the century. Uh, we have uh, a new doctor students now, uh, including groundwater, and probably uh, well, uh, including more uh, sophisticated um, models, more challenging models uh, to uh, to, to uh, simulate as well, like those like a hydrogeosphere can uh, see the interaction between the hydro cycle and the climate, original climate. So this, uh, uh, there are new work under the way uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are not just done the model for uh, done, uh, published and done, we, uh, we want to improve it. Uh, we are also developing uh, teaching modules um, now, uh, there's a lot of literature or podcast or things like by uh, Nobel laureates in behavioral sciences like Daniel Kahneman and Richard Seiler. And according to them, uh, climate change is a very, very difficult, a challenging pedagogical uh, project. It's something amorphous, right? Uh, and uh, uh, usually people use the mental first say the polar bear, uh, is the ice standing on the ice and uh, the Greenland ice is going to melt and the climate uh, sea level going to rise. Uh, that does not do well with IU students. I have been teaching here for 16 years, right? Um, so we are developing tools. This future water site uh, we, um, that provide a good tool. Uh, we have developing um, exercise now to let K-12 students and undergrad students uh, to see the summer basin nearest to your hometown and see how the climate impacts on water resources. And we have 92,000 undergraduates at IU, and those kind of tour uh, is uh, uh, very uh, helpful. And like I said, I'm working with a um, uh, K-12 education specialist, Dr. Adam Scribbler, and, uh, and my students in my class, uh, the, uh, my undergrads in my class, and then they develop K-12 education kits and uh, uh, that'll be available uh, very soon. So, so this is a, a site not only for research, uh, but also for education as well. <clears throat> um, to study climate uh, adaptation, uh, of course, first you need to have the climate model, you need the temperature, precipitation, wind speed, and then you need the water. And once you have water, you can do all the other things, right? So we are kind of a, 
uh, the, the hydrological model is kind of a, the upstream, what I call the upstream uh, research data, and that can be used for uh, this. Um, <clears throat> here I want to show you that uh, we uh, accomplished this uh, with a very, very large team at IU, and uh, that including um, their uh, EI, uh, uh, under the direction of uh, a director, uh, Janet McCabe, and uh, we have this um, uh, implementation special uh, manager, Andrew, you, uh, you, you know that, and there are other uh, people. And uh, Marlon has a bigger group. I have another slide. And also, you see, we handle a tremendous amount of uh, research data and using geographic information system. And that's the group they uh, do this. Um, we also work with the Indiana Geological Survey and the US Geological Survey uh, in Indianapolis. And uh, um, <clears throat> And the, uh, the, the uh, professors at IU Conservation Law Center, they kindly provide guidance and uh, uh, review of the document first. So it's a, um, it's a really, really uh, uh, effort of a very big team and particularly uh, Jennifer, uh, she uh, done uh, the bulk of part of the work and she's, she's brilliant. So I, I, um, I choose this because uh, uh, you can say this is a SWOT model, but it's insulting in some way. It's really Jennifer's model, not a SWOT model. It's like you have a SWOT is like an oven. Uh, you want to bake a cake, it's really uh, you or the person bake the cake. And so this is a, a, a really Jennifer's model, not a, a SWOT model um, in that case. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, the Marlon has a very, very large group and uh, it's really the collaboration uh, with their group uh, that uh, we uh, bring this uh, uh, unreadable data output into the visualization, and we also um, uh, work the uh, work out a workflow um, that um, uh, that we can update uh, automatically, uh, automatically update uh, in the future. Uh, this is slides prepared by Marlon. Uh, I think I will stop here. I have a lot of technical slides. Um, uh, but I don't have the time. <clears throat> um, so what are we going to do uh, in the future about well, future water? And that's what Marlon uh, put together. Well, we need to update. So obviously uh, the climate model drives uh, the hydrological cycle. And when the new uh, climate model become available uh, this year uh, or next year, then we will update that. Um, and Marlon's group is going to build more interactive tools and, um, um, and they want to empower users to build their own tools. And then if you're a power user, you're, you're a hydrogeologist working for a state agency, you want to use the model, uh, you can contact Marlon and myself. We uh, see whether we can uh, open an uh, um, account on I use a supercomputer and help you to run your own model. Um, I think it's, uh, I will stop here. And uh, uh, if I have a chance, um, if you want to know uh, questions about specific uh, technical uh, aspects, and uh, I have the slides for that. How about that, Andrew? That sounds perfect. Okay. Yeah, and, and we can All share right. your email address too when we send out sure. a, um, sure. a follow-up yeah. email. In case I have very uh, some details, you know, what to put into the model, where the data from, and I can make those slides available after this. <clears throat> So uh, thank you so much, Chen. Um, I, I, do, I do want everybody to notice that he put a tie on today. And um, I'm just wondering how many people attending actually have a necktie on today. Um, so thank you for, um, for dressing up. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in um, through the chat. Um, uh, and Andrea, I'll let you do those. But I want to start with one that, uh, that just came to me directly. It's from one of our listeners up in northern Indiana. And her question is whether there are any plans to, uh, to do this kind of uh, data modeling for other river basins in Indiana. And I would add on to that question, um, or how much can people use uh, future water to help answer questions about river basins that are not the Wabash River Basin? Uh, it's possible. Uh, if uh, we have the, uh, uh, we have a graduate student now, and uh, if there's a, 
need a, a good reason uh, that it developed for the northern part uh, near the Great Lake and the southern part uh, that uh, directly discharge Ohio uh, that can be uh, can, can be done. But presumably it would be an easier task now that the heavy lifting of creating the model has been done. Uh, to a, a good student can, can get this done in a couple of months. Okay, great. All right, Andrea, I'll uh, turn it over to you for other questions from the chat room. Great, well, the first question that came in was from Siavash, and Siavash asks, does the model also produce or does the model also, is it also modeling results that are available on peak stream flow? For example, so-called 10-year, 100-year peak discharge est estimates. Yes, we have not a process that we generate a humongous amount of data. We only process a very small amount of it. Yes, if you want to, we wanted the data to, to evaluate that, that we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to provide it to you. All right, and then we had a question come in from Jeff, and he asks, does your modeling consider population growth over time? Increased temperature, et cetera, will have potential greater impact as population grows, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, and that's why we, uh, uh, Marlon and his group and my group have uh, collaborated and we developed this uh, uh, workflow on IU supercomputer. We can easily update the model. So right now we assume the land use, land cover uh, year 2000 and does not change in the future. So, but we can, we can, we can use some kind of a model to predict the land cover land, uh, land use change through the time toward the end of the century and that incorporated population growth, yes. <clears throat> so these two questions are great examples of answers that you could give in the survey when you get it, um, which asks about other things, uh, other uses, other data that might be helpful. Right, right. Like the USGS uh, <laughs> um, uh, office in Indianapolis, they are interested in to reintroduce some muscles into the liver stream system, and they want to say, uh, can you provide the stream temp water temperature? And that can be done. That some some need to have some student to run another module and get the temperature data. So if you have um, more questions, oh looks looks like we've got a few more coming in here. This is great. Um, so one from Jill asks, you mentioned seasonal shifts in soil mo moisture and greater evaporation. Are you able to tell us what this might mean for the realities of corn and soybean growing season specifically? Uh, someone is, has more knowledge about the corn and soybean growth can take my data and do the interpretation. <laughs> right, I, I agree with that. I, th I, th I think that's an example of how yes. other experts in, in other fields might want to use this information. Great question. Yeah. So feel free to enter more questions you have in the, in the chat function. Um, or you can feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question directly yourself if you'd prefer. You can do that by uh, clicking on the microphone uh, button. If you hover over the screen, you'll see a, a microphone button that says mute. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to kind of do a little primer for our survey that's coming out later. So one of the things that we'd like to do is take all of this wonderful, fabulous data that Chen and his team has developed and integrate it into the Hoosier Resilience Index. Uh, so one of the questions we have for all of you is to think about um, which of these pieces of data that are available through Future Water would be most useful in the Hoosier Resilience Index. So that tool, the, the index, is specifically designed for local governments uh, to use. Uh, of course, anyone is able to access that information. So, um, so think about that and, and what kind of um, projections could be incorporated for precipitation or stream flow or uh, water yield and what would be most useful.
Okay, I, I think we've worn everybody out, but I, hopefully um, you have found this to be interesting. Um, please do go to the website and play around with, I'm really glad that you walked us through on the live screen a little bit, Chen, so people could um, get over that first threshold of, oh my gosh, how do I use this thing? Um, play around with it. Um, let us know what questions you have. And um, please do, as I said at the beginning, um, consider joining us for our upcoming webinars or spreading the word. Uh, and we are thrilled to have you today. Thank you to Chen. Thank you to Marlon. And, uh, and thanks always to Andrea for um, being the chief organizer of these. So we will sign off and uh, give you back um, six minutes of your, of your coronavirus filled day. Um, I wish everybody good health. Uh, be careful um, and, uh, and take advantage of, uh, of, of extra time that you might have in whatever way is meaningful to you. All right, take care, everyone. Well, take care, everyone. Stay safe.